Hi, I'm Joe Pena, and this is Enlighten Me. Discussions with people on a mission, perhaps like you, who have a commitment to your purpose and the courage to see it through. Today I'm talking with Jen McCarty. Jen is a spiritual teacher, speaker, musician, and singer. In helping others awaken and grow spiritually, she explains this using an analogy of a candle. When a candle is lit, it is very easy to light other candles. She has quite a successful following on the Facebook group called The Event is Happening. Jen is also an inspiration to a group of people who feel a pull to the subject of Twin Flames. We're going to have a discussion for people who aren't yet familiar with your work, or you for that matter, Jen. But for now, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. It is absolutely amazing to be here. For anybody who hasn't witnessed it, you are described as a musician and a singer. So I'd like for you to maybe help me out understand how that comes into play with what you do. Um, well, it's just, it's just a natural gift that I've always had. I come from a very musical family and mm. uh, my grandfather, he, he learned um, how to play the piano just by, he could, he could hear a song and he could just play it. Um, to be honest, I, my, my family is very, very gifted creatively. And um, I just think it's like it was innate. I mean, I could sing with perfect pitch when I was very, very young. And, um, but then as I deepened on my spiritual path and um, I had my spiritual awakening when I was age 21 on top of a Himalayan mountain, the first message that I received from God, well, because I basically met God and, um, and, and God told me that I would, I would share my message of that, of this experience of meeting God mainly through music and I would transmit the the most kind of like divine and sacred codes that are connected to my mission through music so even though it was a natural gift I think my spirituality has very very much deepened that gift and and I you know I always sing music that that is prayerful or meditative or music that invokes those spiritual frequencies within us so mm. i do a lot of mantra a lot of prayer a lot of rainbow songs a lot of medicine songs so yeah so jen you mentioned the the, the himalayas when you were 21 yeah, yeah. How, how long were you on that path in particular that led you to the point of even getting there to begin with well, um, when I was about 15, I, I um, became very, very interested in astrology. And I, and I found that I had a, had a kind of like a, a, an aptitude for astrology, like a, an, an, um, an, an understanding of it that I'd only just learned about it, but I just ha had an instinctive understanding about astrology. And then that got me on a path to learning about crystals, I Ching, um, uh, meditation, like all, all these different aspects of spirituality. But they were, it was just like I was kind of like, window shopping going oh there's I Ching there's numerology oh there's astrology <laughs> and um and then when I was 18 I met this woman that who, who was grew up in Hawaii and her name was Andromeda and um she was a bit older than me and she she was on a spiritual path and that was connected to her auntie in Hawaii and so she had the books from um Shakti Gawain and I think it was Louise Hay that I found out through through Andromeda and um so I read the book um Creative Visualization by Shakti Gawain and in that book she introduces you to your higher self in the form of a masculine and feminine guardian angel so I read this book when I was 18 and I met my guardian angels and she, she guides you just to ask them what their names are. And I just innocently asked them what their names are. And I heard clearer than, clearer than a bell ringing. I heard the masculine angel said his name was Christopher and the feminine angel told me that her name was Elijah. So I was like, oh, well, my guardian angels are Christopher and Elijah. And I, and I started having like a, a relationship with them. And then I got to India a couple of years later when I was 21 and, um, and I, as soon as I got to India, I started having these visions that I was going to be meeting a physical embodiment of Christopher in, in the form of a soulmate. So every time I meditated, I could see this outline of this man and my spirit guides told me that, that his name, that this was Christopher. And so I ended up going on this long journey up into the Himalayas and I, and I met this, this wonderful man. I was with, traveling with a group of us. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he said to me was, was that his spiritual name is Christopher. And then he then guided us up on this um, very, very long trek 
up up the up the Himalayan mountains, and um, and basically. I'm really sorry. Can we just cut for one minute? Is my dog barking going to be a problem? Because I might have to go and sort him out. Okay. So back to my story. Mm -hmm. So we traveled up this very, very, very long, treacherous mountain in the Himalayas. And, um, and basically I got to the top of the mountain and I had a strong urge, like a strong intuitive urge that, I was to be on my own and so I just walked away from the group and I I basically went to the edge of the cliff and I looked up at the sky and I was oh I forgot to tell you just before we went on the um on this trek up the up the Himalayas I met this woman and she said to me you must chant the mantra Om Namah Shivaya please chant the mantra Om Namah Shivaya so the whole time up the mountain, I just, I chanted the mantra Om Namah Shivaya. And in that moment, when it was time for me to be on my own, I basically walked to the edge of the cliff and I was chanting the mantra Om Namah Shivaya. And I looked up at the sky and I suddenly saw this flash of light. And in that moment, I realized that I was in the presence of God, but God wasn't this um, scary old man that my Catholic religion had told me about this man with a long gray beard judging everyone like in the sky i realized that god is the vibration of love which is the the energy of creation and in that moment it was like literally my third eye blasted open and and i just went into full and complete god consciousness and i realized that every single blade of grass and every single grain of sand is intricately woven into the perfection of creation and that there is not one aspect of creation that doesn't have a guardian angel every single aspect of creation is guarded over by angelic beings so i was shown um, implicitly about oneness that that all is one everything is one I am one all is one all that exists is oneness and if it's not if, if you if your consciousness is not aligned to the truth of oneness then you are in an illusion that's what I was shown and this light it entered into through my crown and basically as it got down to my belly that that was where I stored all the fear because I'm a very deep soul with a lot of Scorpio in my chart and um and I'd carried a lot of fear in my in my belly because I believed I was separate I believed my egoic narrative that you know that, that had convinced me that you know there was no god I'd been abandoned uh, it was it was just a complete survival experience and like uh, my ego was invested in that belief of, of separation and um so I often explain to people that my experience was like, prior to, prior to that experience, I, I perceived myself as an individualized drop of water, like a singular drop of water. And in that moment, that singular drop of water returned home to the ocean. And it was like, once that singular water, like drop of water returned home to the ocean. I remembered that I am the whole entire ocean. And I realized that we all are that, that we are all intricately connected to this, to this web of perfection of creation. And, and that's the greatest way that I can, I can describe what happened to me. It was like the singular drop of water returning back to the ocean. That was basically what happened. And, um, and so I had this experience and it lasted for about 10 minutes. And then and then I, oh, and I was told a lot of things about, about what my, um, my, about my destiny. I think that was the next day, actually. So the day, so after that experience happened, I, um, I was guided to go and tell my friend Dean, who was called, who was Christopher, his spiritual name was Christopher. And the same thing had happened to him when he was 21. He had ended up having a really, really full on spiritual awakening. And then the next day I woke up and I just started getting loads and loads of downloads about the nature of reality. And it was like, and it was like my heart became the sacred scriptures. And, it, and I started having this direct experience of my heart be literally being the sacred scriptures. And, um, and it was like, I was just getting like download after download about, because prior to that experience, I, I, I didn't know what love is. Love was a two dimensional word. I mean, I loved my mum, but I didn't know about divine love. I didn't know what eternity was. That was a two dimensional word. I had no understanding of, of, 
of that word. I didn't know what infinity is. I didn't know what timelessness is. And so the day after that experience, I was getting like educated and taught by my higher self about what, what these words truly, truly mean. And it was like I penetrated the, the deepest depths of, of gnosis around eternity, of timelessness, of infinity, of love, of God, God consciousness. And um, so that, that basically activated a very, very powerful Kundalini awakening. And, um, and, and so I started experiencing a lot of bliss in my, from, from, my, from my base. And it was just like getting loads and loads of rushes of bliss. And, um, and then the next day I looked at my, my soul brother, Dean, and I looked in his eyes and clearer than the, the blue sky above me, I, I saw the Christ self in him. And I'd never seen it in anyone else, not even a child, but I saw it clearer than day. I, I saw the Christ being in him. And then it's because I could see it so distinctly and so clearly and so obviously, I realized that it was in me as well that I wouldn't be able to see it in him if it wasn't in me. And then in that moment, I realized that every single one of us is, is the Christ. Every single one of us, no matter where, no matter where you are on your spiritual evolutionary path, you hold the seed of the Christ self within you. Whether that becomes the fruit of your true, true awakening, that's another story. But everyone, every single one of God's creations holds that, the truth of those, those Christ codes within them. So that was a bit, bit of a revelation for me. I was like, oh my God, they don't tell you that in school, do they? That every single one of your brothers and sisters mm -hmm. that is incarnated alive is the holiest of the holiest of the holiest. And um, so it was all just a big, massive revelation for me. And then I realized, I was like, holy macaroni, that no one's awake. There's literally no one. And, and that's what I realized. It was, it was kind of like a very, very rare sort of... Um, plateau that, that I arrived at mm -hmm. and um it was it was in 1995 I was very young and, and, it, and it was a, it was a lonely path I mean obviously I was very very much you know at one with God and I was in a state of ecstatic bliss but in terms of having other other you know humans who understood that that, that just wasn't wasn't a reality but what I realized when I had that experience was that I had that experience in order to give, give it away to all my brothers and sisters. Like that was the first thing I realized. As soon as my third eye blasted open, I realized that this was for all my brothers and sisters. This, this was, I was having the experience in order for it to be given away. And, um, and so that, that, was what, that was what I, you know, and that's what I've devoted my whole entire life to is, is sharing that experience of, being blasted with God and you know I now the way I look at it it's like most people sign if you're lucky will sign up for a spoonful of God consciousness some people that are like teachers and whatever that they might get a cup of God consciousness but I actually signed up for the whole entire bottle and I I basically had an overdose of God and but it was a necessary overdose because it, it had to spill out just had to be spilled out so that all of my brothers and sisters could um could also like be you know have the gift of that experience of what I experienced so yeah there's a lot to share and I'm speaking a lot about this in my book okay we're going to get to your book in just a bit yeah and, yeah yeah we're definitely going to have that discussion I, I really just want to cover something that I was wondering about and it was specifically about the downloads see you talked mm -hmm. about being in in the Himalayas in yep. India and receiving yep. downloads what was that experience of receiving the downloads? Was it like a mind's eye seeing and seeing and feeling and hearing? What was that like? It was the closest thing that I can compare it to is ecstasy. And um, it was so basically it was like a different areas of my body. So I was getting angelic whispers. Like it was almost like the angels were whispering continuously um, messages about, about God and about the true nature of reality. And then as these messages would come, it was almost like my higher self was like pouring down these messages that then that would then somehow connect with my Kundalini energy. And then it would cause a rush of my Kundalini energy. So it was a very, very, um, deeply ecstatic somatic experience like it, it it was unlike anything I've ever ever known before but it, it was like it was a it was a bit like being on 
on very hardcore drugs in a way, but, but without, obviously without being on drugs at all. But that's my only kind of reference that I can compare it to. Um, do you know what I mean? I happen to, yes, know what you mean. <laughs> and, and, and I'd also like to say that, um, so what you were, you were in a state of ecstasy and yeah. these downloads occurred for you. And then at some point, they it eased off and eased away and probably yeah. filtered in a very slow kind of, didn't even realize and you were going from that state of utter bliss and ecstasy into a state of almost normalcy. But at the same time, when you did come out of that ecstasy into this place of normalcy, if you will, mm -hmm. what was that feeling like? Did you feel like the gen that you were before? Or were you still in some sort of residual experience of what that was like for you? So basically, um, I, I was in the middle of my second year of my degree. And when I had my spiritual awakening, I wrote to my university and said, I'm not coming back. I'm staying in India. And so I stayed in that extremely ecstatic, blissful state for that whole time in India, which was a six month experience. So then as soon as I got back to the UK, I felt myself, it was, it was like I was flying. Basically my whole experience in India, even though I'm a very, very grounded person, I've got loads of Capricorn in my chart. I, I was having the experience where my soul consciousness was flying. And so when I got back to the UK, it was just this really, really super, super gliding gentle landing that's just what happened I just kind of landed and I landed and so the experience of landing was that I stopped getting all the rushes um so intensely I mean but it altered me completely because the experience that I had it basically kind of like took away the egoic programming really and all that was left with was my true self my divine childlike innocent self and so I became more myself than I had ever 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 been <laughs> that that was that was my direct experience um and so it, it I think about that experience probably about 50 times a day and it, it, it is a part of the core of who I am. There is not a second really that goes by when it, it's not who I am. So I never ever experienced a, a separation or detachment from that experience. It was always like a really full on umbilical cord that was always connecting me to that vibration of that experience. And so... I came back to the UK and I just came back with so much wisdom and so much love and so much compassion and, and, and such a desire to serve. Like I just wanted to serve like 24 seven. I just wanted to look after my brothers and sisters. I wanted to look after my family. I wanted to let everyone know that it's all going to be all right, that God is real. And I'm really, really sorry that this is such a shit show, pardon my language, but I, you know that this, this illusion is so, is so heavy duty but I just wanted everyone to know that it's all amazing. Like God is real and we are, it is our duty and responsibility to attune to that remembrance of God consciousness. So it never, ever left me. And, um, it is who I am. And I, I feel like it's given me a huge kind of like oomph or boost in terms of how I show up in the world. I think that's pretty evident, at least to me it is, and I'm sure to many other people who yeah. come to know you through your work. Jen, um, when you mentioned that you could tap into that about 50 times a day, uh -huh. after having had that experience, and I imagine it just imprinted itself within your being. Yeah. Yes. Um, while you may not always be in an ecstatic state like you had been, yeah. you, can, you can easily and readily tap into it. Would that be accurate? I can easily... I can't tap into that kind of like ecstatic rush experience, but I can tap into that ocean of wellness mm -hmm. and that ocean of remembrance that, that comes when, when you know that, that, you know, God is your best friend and all the ascended beings are your best friends and, and you've made it like I, I, when I had that experience on top of the mountain, mm -hmm. I implicitly understood that 
every single soul that returns back to the earthly plane on their reincarnation cycles comes in order to experience what I experienced. Like that is the final culmination of the human experience where you remember your oneness with God, like deeply, absolutely, and implicitly. And so I realized that I reached a, a plateau, which every soul is seeking, whether it's in this lifetime, whether it's in a thousand lifetimes, everyone is on this trajectory to to come home to to full remembrance all right let's fast forward then we, we were left you in in uh, in the himalayas you came mm-hmm. back to the uk yeah and you mentioned that you you glided in yeah. at, at some point i imagine you ran headlong into 3d uh, no, no. I, I mean, I, obviously, like, I had to interface with 3D reality all the time, mm-hmm. but I never, ever... Well, saying that, I... What happened was, it's a bit of a complicated story, mm-hmm. but I ended up moving to Glastonbury. I stayed in a very, very, very high aligned and ecstatic state for maybe a good 12 years after my experience. But what happened was, I ended up hanging out with a group of people who had spent a lot of time in India. They all dressed in white. They all had dreadlocks. They looked the part. They looked like they had done the work to, to, to become like spiritual masters. Mm-hmm. But, but what happened was, was that this group of people were actually hedonists and they had no interest at all in, in the right path. They were actually on the left path, which is all about kind of like making choices that, that like devilish choices that, that kind of like make make you out of alignment with god and so but because of i went into angelic consciousness i would just meet everyone and i would just put that i would put that assumption on them you're an angelic consciousness especially if you look like me especially if you've had a similar like like um you know life to me i.e spending a lot of time in india and all that and rainbow gatherings and what have you and so what happened was I ended up getting getting involved in with a group of people that had not escaped the matrix. And so their programming started to infiltrate and I didn't even realize that that was going on. And, it, and then it was in 2012 that my, so this was only going on for a couple of years, but my spirit team flagged it up and they said, we need to cut you from that group. And that, that they were my friends for 15 years. And so a situation was orchestrated for me to split from that group. And then the moment I split from that group, I realized that, that they were all caterpillars. They were all 3d caterpillars. They had not ascended into 5d butterfly consciousness. And I was 5d butterfly, but I'd been hanging out with, with caterpillars. And so I noticed that there was a little, little, little bit of infiltration programming that had somehow slipped in from that group but the moment I left that group I was like boom I was like I I basically had it I I went on to have another kundalini awakening in 2013 which was connected to um leaving that group of people so does does that answer your question as a matter of fact it addresses it uh really well actually in a way that I didn't anticipate because uh, I was in, envisioning you making your way through the world and mm-hmm. interacting with 3D and having perhaps having challenges with just normal everyday life. But yeah. what you had was a unique experience mm-hmm. in that you aligned yourself with people who looked and felt very much very similar. Mm-hmm. And by virtue of that, you came to learn a very valuable lesson in that uh, things are not always what they appear. Yes. And that... Um, while you may hold other people in the highest light, and they do hold that light, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They may just not be connected to it. And that's all that is to it. Because you spoke earlier about seeing the Christ and knowing the Christ in everyone. So by virtue of that, how could this particular group not have it within them as well, right? Um, Oh my God, absolutely. Yet they weren't expressing it. How interesting that it took... Uh, whatever period of time, in whatever ways, but somehow, somewhere within you, you felt that it was affecting you. And it was that which that, that called up into you. And all I'm really emphasizing here, Jen, is the thing that we all have within us, and that's the ability to call up this recognition. You see, the point that I was making was that 
uh, you tapped into something within yourself that many people do, whether they've had a spiritual awakening or not. But yeah. in your case, it was it was something that you might not expect a to happen in terms of falling into ways of being once you've had an awakening recognizing that there was something within you that wasn't in alignment with how you wanted to express yourself in this world and to course correct and do so in a way that was loving mostly to yourself and also recognizing the divinity within all these other people without the judgment that might have come along with it yes yeah 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 definitely that that is what happened and um you know but it, it was a big lesson for me to you know because of, because of having that experience so young you just think everyone remembers their divinity and everyone remembers that they're an angel on earth and that that was a bit of a pitfall for me they are that but they don't remember that <laughs> and they're making choices that are you know i mean these people that i'm speaking about these are originally part of the 144,000 but they are high level souls that have come back and have chosen the the path of escapism drug addiction and and hedonism mm -hmm. and so the these people like I, I know them from past lives I know them from even from Israel 2000 years ago and things like that and so it was very very convincing that that they are on this team this they are on this um ascension team you know but it, it, it was very very obvious that that they weren't on the ascension team in fact this people this group of people that i'm talking about are on the dissension path and so they are making choices that are can only be described as devilish and they are the choices that they are making and um yeah i i don't think they're making god happy at all and i get like full-on goosebumps because you know, God, God doesn't want to see her children just self-destruct, like, you know, hit the self-destruct button. And that's what they're doing. That's what all this whole group is doing. They've, none of them have, um, have chosen the ascension path, really. They've all gone 100% 3D. It's really service, sad. Would you say service to self, service, service to self. Service to self. Yes. They're all about drugs. They're all about partying, mm -hmm. going out, getting high. Oh, what can, oh, mm -hmm. I just want to feel that. It's like, no, that's not why you're here. You're here to make this world beautiful for all your brothers and sisters, not to be sitting there in a self-induced, you know, whatever, bubble of whatever. But anyway, that's another story. That is, it's a big part of my life that was leaving that group of people. Yeah, I imagine, it, I imagine it was disappointing too for you, for that matter. It was, yeah, because it was a clan. I was part of this clan mm. and we all had our kids together and, um, and then it was like I was a lone wolf. And, mm. and that's hard for the soul to, to have to move, move on, it, on its solo path. But I, I had to stay on my solo path for a really, really long time. Um, you know, and then eventually I, I, I sort of like went public with my gifts and my teachings. But it took me till... Well, 2015 was when I wrote my first energy report. So that was, that was like 20 years after my spiritual awakening experience. And um, I always resisted the, um, like going public. It wasn't something that I ever um, wanted because I always felt that it would create a separation between me and my, my, my brothers and sisters and that, that I would get projected on as being special. And I never, ever wanted that. I wanted us all to just be in a circle and realize that we're all one. And, um, and so that is what, what kind of like blocked me from stepping forward but then i connected with the higher self of my divine counterpart who is a public figure and he his higher self said to me that we will never ever come into union unless you like step out into the public eye and so i i, I kind of feel like you know i had him basically kicking me up the bum and mm -hmm. I, I i don't think i would have done it I, I definitely wouldn't have done it i would have just been quietly doing my little thing and um doing my great work but not with a platform or not with a, you know, I, I would have just probably been anonymous. I quite like the idea of being anonymous, mm. but anyway, it's fine. I, I chose that path and I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it now. There's safety in anonymity. Mm -hmm. And evidently you got to a point where you chose between safety and doing the work in the world that you're here yeah. to do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned going uh, being a lone wolf for all those years. That was a courageous thing to do because whether you knew 
what was ahead of what lied ahead of you or not, that period of uh, being the lone wolf, I am sure, resulted in even further growth and maturity on your part. Extraordinary level of growth. Mm -hmm. What we've done is I've seen, known that you've gone and been in India for six months. That's a long time, from mm -hmm. my perspective, to be mm -hmm. immersed in that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. Because that immersion there is one thing, but to, and to step away from it and to go into, say, a 3D setting like you did when you returned. Yeah. Not to return to old ways or, or even, for that matter, find a way to make your way into the world. Uh, like so many people are having a challenge doing. Uh, these are things that I think are, are quite common to many. However, the thing that I feel is very uncommon is that they manage to spend a whole six-month period or maybe even longer immersed in that space, immersed in that, that way of being, that way of living, the way of experiencing our lives. So, um, I mean, I attribute a very significant amount of uh, credence to the time that you spent in that coming back and keeping and maintaining your ability to uh, walk that path, if you will. How do you feel about that? Do you feel like you could have done the same by having just come back maybe the next week? No, I had to, I had to have that six months in India mm. in order to um, completely free myself of the third dimensional matrix program. Mm. And um, I think for myself, I've, I've, I'm a soul reader and I've read my own soul. And I would say that I've had 90% of my lifetimes in Indi as an Indian Baba. Mm. Um, and so when my soul returned home to the Himalayas, there, there was like layers upon layers upon layers of, of, of energy, of, of the frequency of home for my soul to, it was like, um, it was like, it was like a, a, a puzzle and India was like the, the, the placeholder for my, the puzzle of myself to, to fit back into. And then as I fitted back into the matrix of India, I basically dismantled from the third dimensional matrix of the, of the West. And uh, the six month period enabled me to fully, fully clear all of that programming mm. or like 98.9% at least. Um, so yeah. And when I got back, it was just, I wasn't so ecstatically high, but I was um, still completely aligned and completely connected and illuminated. And, you know, all of my friends, they, everyone got on a spiritual path all around me. Even my friends were quite sort of middle class, well off kind of posh people really that weren't into spirituality and they all just suddenly started like meditating and like reading spiritual books and going to workshops so I could see it was having a massive effect on everyone around me not so much my family but my family could see that I had become my true self and that was that was obviously an, an amazing gift for them and um yeah okay well all that said <clears throat> because I put the emphasis on immersing yourself in that space for so long, there's a practical matter of people in today's world, especially in today's world where the connecting we do with others, for example, is electronically like the two of us are doing right now. And how beautiful that there are places like Facebook, which happens to have a maybe positive and not so positive aspects to it. But the one positive thing is that there are groups on Facebook of people who align together and join together and, and basically come into a space where they can be in that way that I feel that you might have been when you were in the Himalayas. And you have a group on Facebook. This group is rather large as I understand it. How, what is the energy like in that space? Um, well, I mean, when I created the group that, I mean, that's a whole nother subject matter, my, my group, because it's called the event is happening and it's connected to the solar flash event that, um, I received a message from my spirit team in 2017, um, that there was going to be a solar flash event and the, and I was shown a timeline whereby all of this magenta light comes into the earth and the, it isn't light. It's actually, um, like, like basically 
tangible God's God presence, really. That's what it is. It's like, so literally everyone is going to get hit by this force of remembrance of, of, of the divinity of nature. And my guy said to me, this is really, really happening. And it's all to do with the collective consciousness. Um, basically, like I was shown without words that, that in order to attract the event, humanity's consciousness has to reach a critical mass of awakened beings and it's and i think it's around the 51 percent mark but as soon as that occurs then our our collective timeline will shift and then we will come into alignment with the timeline of the solar flash event so my my team like showed me this whole kind of like you know play out of what was going to happen and they said to me like this event really really is is about to happen and you know you need to let people know about that so I, I just I accepted it. I was like, okay, wow, that's absolutely amazing. And I kind of put it on the back burner. And then two months later, a friend of mine wrote on Facebook, has anyone heard of the event? And I was like, oh, I've heard of the event. <laughs> and um, she, she was the only person I'd ever heard speak about the event. Mm. And then she, she sent me these videos um, from this woman whose son had passed over. And then he was bringing through information about the solar flash event. And it was completely um, in alignment with the message that I had received. And then I was brought to Alison Coe's work, who's a QHHT practitioner. And yeah, yeah, and and all of her clients that she was regressing were coming out with the same information that there's going to be a solar flash event. So lo and behold, I found myself down this rabbit hole of like loads and loads of people that were talking about the event. And um, so then I just realized that I was being guided to create some sort of forum for people to come together to, to, to prepare for the event and to talk about and discuss the event. And so one day I was just casually sitting at my computer and I just decided to create a group called The Event Is Happening. And um, I'd already been doing twin flame transmissions for a couple, about two or three years. So I had a core of about three to 500 women that were completely committed to this work in the transmissions. So the day I created the group, I added all those women. And so that was like a really powerful spiritual core was, 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 was created on day one of the the group. And then within, it was, it was utterly ridiculous. It's something like we had, I mean, I'm going to say it was something like 11,000 people joined us in the first week. It just was a zeitgeist movement. It was like suddenly everyone was just hearing about the event. Like a lot of people were having dreams about the event. It was in March, 2018. And so we had loads of people join the group because they, they had an intuitive hit about the event and then they put into Facebook the event and then our group would come up so it was incredible um, to, 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 to witness that, that sort of like um, coming together of all of these star seeds. And um, I, I decided very, very quickly that I, I was going to run a very, very tight ship in my group. And um, I immediately attracted loads and loads of moderators that wanted to help me. Had about, I've got about 30 moderators on the group. But I basically made sure that we were all singing from the same hymn sheet. And that is that that we do not tolerate any um, rudeness, any abuse, any, any trolling behavior. If you come with a negative energy, you will be basically booted out of the group. That, that, that is just the way it is that that was my, um, my guidance was this isn't, this isn't only a loving space. This is a space where we're kind to each other. This is a space where we we are co-creating the frequencies of the new earth, where we're supporting each other to grow and expand and fanning the flames of each other's spiritual gifts so if you're not working in resonance with with that vibration it's just not going to work for you go you have to go and find another group so because of that everyone felt this incredible safety and also because I've got a very strong mother energy I, I work a lot with the Mary energy and so people felt like my higher self was like a mama bear you know like like guarding over the space and um we had like 22,000 people join by the second month and each month it was just rolling by. It was exponentially just expanding. Um, and then, but then after the first year we got, we got shadow banned by Facebook and we stopped coming up in all of the news feeds. Like you, basically because previously to that we would come up in the news feed, but our group would come up. It just stopped coming up. And then all of the places where our group was um, publicized, 
um, you know, it would flash up a little group, like it all went. And so but we, we managed to maintain a very, very, very high level of engagement, even though we were getting shadow banned. But then eventually I, I lost my Facebook platform a few weeks ago. And, um, and so the group, I, I'm not, I'm not an admin in the group at the moment and I don't know if I ever will be again. So, but that's another story. Okay. So you, you did create this space. Yeah. It was a safe space. It still is. Um, beautiful. I'm glad to hear that. Mm. Um, is, is your group of moderators, the ones that you had selected, are they the ones still running it? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Are they yeah. still running from the same hymn sheet? Absolutely. They all love me so much. Mm -hmm. I am such a loved person. <laughs> and I, I don't know, they just, it, it's weird. You know, I would like to say that the, the ground rules that you laid, some would call it intolerant, because you wouldn't tolerate rude behavior, etc. Yeah. I refer to it as just maintaining good boundaries, boundaries that enabled you to create this safety for people to come in and be however they were. And isn't that the same kind of safety that you, em, you embroiled yourself in within, when you were in the Himalayas? Exactly. So Absolutely. how unsurprising it is that you created this space virtually here for people. Yeah, I think, I think that just about sums up my whole entire life. My whole life is a constant desire to, to bring that energy into the present moment, no matter who I'm with, whether I'm like going to the supermarket I, I see it as an opportunity to connect with that that beautiful sister that is serving me like I just want to be present with her I want to connect with her I see every single moment as an opportunity to create heaven on earth and um and, and we must we must we are angels in human form and uh, that is our job to create heaven on earth and I'm 100% committed to it and I don't have any days off I don't have any hours off I'm just beautiful. I'm just on it as well you should be by yeah. virtue of what you have that you can offer and bring to the world. Thank you. Now, what I'd like to do is cover two last topics okay. uh, together, intertwined, because I'm sure yeah, they sure. are. And those topics are A, Twin Flames, yep. and B, the book that you're writing. Okay. So do me a favor and start for anybody who's not familiar with the concept of Twin Flames. Help us understand that and then dive right into you, whatever aspects of that and the book that you'd like to cover. Okay. So um, what I've been shown is that everything I share is, is, uh, is nothing is read, nothing is regurgitated. I don't know if anyone's ever said this. This is what I've been shown by my spirit team. And what I've been shown is that at the beginning of creation, all that existed was a white ovoid light. And it existed as that for bazillions and bazillions of eons of time. And at some point within that, existence of this white ovoid sphere it was decreed amongst itself a council was called and it was decreed amongst itself that that there would a split would be allowed to take place in order for that light to look upon itself and see itself and know itself and recognize itself in order to have the experience of being separate so that one could come back together in sacred union and so in that original split, I was shown that as the souls split forth from the, um, the great ovoid white light, they split forth as a unit of masculine and feminine energy because the masculine and feminine energy is like two sides of the same coin. You cannot have one side of a coin. If you create a coin, there's always two sides and it's the same with the masculine and feminine energy. Mother, father, God doesn't sit there and create a, a masculine it's like you mother father god co-creates a masculine and feminine unit of, of of creation and so that is what existed for for for, for trillions of years we existed as separate from source energy but in our in our androgynous soul pods containing the perfect um vibratory signature so so each masculine and feminine contains the identical vibratory signature as each other or one could also say the identical macabre patterning because we're all fractals from the, um, from the, from the mother Merkaba and we're all fractals of that mother Merkaba. And so as twins split from the mother Merkaba, we ha hold identical patternings as the masculine and feminine. And so I was shown that, that these androgynous pods stay together for 
eons of time and again a great council was called and it was decreed that that which had been separated forever i.e these masculine and feminine units would be allowed to separate in order to have that experience of being polarized in order to have that experience of being able to go out as individualized aspects of consciousness in 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 our polarized forms in order to gather information and gather experiences which ultimately can be brought back to the godhead in order to create an expansion within the godhead and so i was shown that this split um, occurred whereby the the androgynous po pod split into the masculine and feminine energies and then we then went off on our individual incarnations now i was shown that prior to the fall of atlantis the twin flames even though we had split into our polarized forms we still were contracted to um always come into physical union wherever wherever we incarnated whether that's the pleiades whether that's lemuria whether that's lyra it was it was just a part of our soul contract that we would always always incarnate at the same time i.e never experience separation from each other even though we're in our polarized forms but I was shown that at the time of Atlantis, when this experiment was allowed to take place with humanity's DNA, whereby it was um, scrambled from its 12 strand diamond formation, and it was scrambled and it became two strand with a 10, 10 strand so-called junk DNA, offline DNA. And so this is all connected to, basically our DNA is the roadmap back to our divinity. And so it was scrambled with at the time of Atlantis to cause confusion in mother, father, God's children so that 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 roadmap back to the remembrance of our divinity was tampered with and this this massively affected the um the memories of of the twin flames and so i was shown that at the time of atlantis this was when the the twins actually experienced their core primary split from each other and in all of the work that i do most of the trauma that, that twins are dealing with are from that split in atlantis i've just facilitated a, a big massive global ceremony about recorrecting that timeline so um a twin flame is is the the one that you is it literally is a twin it's a bit like a conjoined twin like we all have this like an element of ourselves that is a conjoined aspect but we um not everyone awakens to that that's the thing i've just wrote a chapter of that in my book you know people ask me all the time does everyone have a twin flame and my answer is yes everyone has a twin flame but not everyone is so contracted to unite with their twin flame in this lifetime not everyone is contracted to remember the fact that they are a twin flame but it doesn't mean that we don't all have twin flames because the masculine and feminine energy cannot be created independently from each other so basically a twin flame is your identical vibrational counterpart and i mean i i, I go into huge depth about this in my book and it, it's all related to the 144 monadic soul structure which is 72 masculine and 72 feminine and we all stand in a circle of, of the outer ring being the masculine polarity um, 72 masculine polarity within the 144 soul group and then the inner circle is the 72 feminine polarities and, and we're all standing opposite our vibrational counterpart within that great um great circle of our particular monadic soul group and so so the one that you stand opposite with that is your t tonal match that is your identical tonal partner you have a group of people that you're you're walking through this twin flame experience are you not well i have a, i have a massive online community i wouldn't necessarily say i have a few people i think mm -hmm. I, I yeah i think many 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 people okay you say your online community and where is that community located well, I've still got my group, still got 100,000 people in the group. Mm -hmm. I've still got my Facebook. I've still got my YouTube. Um, I've got other social media platforms. I've got my subscription. I've got my blog, uh, you know. Okay. Now, we talked about your book. What is the yeah. title of your book? The title of my book is Twin Flames and the Event, A Message for the 144,000 Star Seeds." And if someone were interested in purchasing your book, where would they go and do that? Well, I'm going to be um, creating, excuse me, I'm going to be creating a pre-order section on Amazon, hopefully within the next week. I've just completed the first draft of the book. With a, I've just got to do a couple more bonus chapters, but um, 
I, I, I've pretty much done the first draft of the book, which means now I can focus on actually uploading the book. And, and you know, so it's going to be available for pre-order, but also I'm going to be doing a limited edition version because I channel light codes, Pleiadian light codes. So I'm going to be having a hardback version like and, and there's going to be dotted in there's going to be Pleiadian light codes and there's going to be a few special editions of that so so that 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 will also be um you'll, you'll be able to pre-order that as well now jen you are planning on having a webinar to yes. um, promote the launch of the book yes tell, tell me about both the webinar and about the launch and the launch date so the launch date is the 14th of February and um, I'm really open to doing any interviews or podcasts or radio interviews or magazine spreads um, to let people know about my book. And um, the webinar is just, I think what we're going to be focusing on is clearing any blocks um, that are preventing you from coming together with your twin. And um, we're going to be working with very, very powerful magical codes that will assist you to, to attract your twin flame so it's going to be around that particular area but also i'll be i'll be sharing a lot about about what you need to do because it like it's not a soulmate relationship with a soulmate relationship you don't really have to do the spiritual work you can you can get by with just being 3d and you can meet a decent soulmate have a have a decent job have a nice house like you can just get on with it and not really awaken but that's not the twin flame path the twin flame path is that you have to realize that it is your duty and responsibility to awaken and and become a spiritual master and to um have some sort of like like understanding that your egoic narrative is not who you truly are and so we're going to be talking about like i'm going to be sharing spiritual practices with people that will help them align with their 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 true mastery codes and you know that's the whole point of the of the twin flame path is that we are leaders we are masters we are teachers we are way showers and so we have to just keep keep stepping up to the plate and keep you know adjusting our vibration so that we become one with our higher self and then when you become one with your higher self you have this experience of the the circle is complete and then once you within your own being, you know that the circle is complete. There's no more lack, There's no more lack programming. There's just a case of wanting to be in service. And so when you're in that place where there's no more lack, that is when you become truly magnetic to your twin. And it's all about divine timing. Like for myself, I I've reached that place and I, I really, really am not fussed even when I come into physical union, I feel it's going to be happening very, very, very fast, but it's not, there's no lack programming in me. There's just this amazing feeling of excitement, of joy, of, of knowing that, that it cannot not come because there's, there's no resistance in me that's pushing it away. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I sure do know what you mean. And I definitely feel what you mean, Jen. Thank you. So this must be very empowering to the people who come to these um, these events that you have. They are events that you have that are so that are twin flame specific, are they not? Yes, I every um, on every numerological portal date, such as the one one two two three three four four etc. Mm -hmm. I host global meditations, and um, they are very very much connected to um, basically your ascension and assisting you to transform from caterpillar consciousness to butterfly consciousness, assisting you to go from that two strand scramble DNA formation to that twelve strand perfected diamond formation. That that is a lot of what my work involves, and it's kind of like working on really really polishing up your own vibration so that you you can become completely magnetic to your divine counterpart that's what it's all about so there's work involved yeah loads <laughs> yeah well i think for anybody who resonates with that the the work isn't something that would uh, sway them from wanting to pursue no. it no, because not. clearly if they if they've had a desire for something like that for a connection like that and have not received it to date. Clearly, something is missing, and perhaps yeah, they can find out. Yeah, there's work to do. 
There's, mm. uh, unless you're at a place where you're totally at peace and it's just not an issue, then mm. there's still a bit of work to do, I'd say. And, um, and it's great. We're all on this wonderful journey together. And, mm. um, yeah, but I do, I do loads of things. I, do, I, do, I have loads and loads of offerings. And people can go um, to my website, which is Jen McCarty dot co dot uk and um check out all my offerings i've got amazing courses and um, i share with you all about my transmissions and um got loads of mp3s really powerful mp3s and um yeah is there anything that you're doing with regard to winter winter solstice Yes, thank you so much for asking, Joe. I'm going to be um, hosting a, a large global meditation on the 21st of December. And we're going to be working with the Aboriginal elders who are the guardians of Uluru. And they have been told that it's time for the black box in Uluru to be opened. And all of the elders have asked for people to come together in their soul groups, ascension groups, to all meditate and send really, really good energy to the opening of this black box. I've received a lot of direct intel about the black box and about what is actually um, contained within it. And it is connected to the star system of the Pleiades and it's also connected to the elemental realms. So I will be sharing with everyone um, all of the intel that I've been. That I've received about the black box and we will be assisting with all of the elders in this great grand event which is going to be taking place on the grand conjunction and also i will be hosting a one day spiritual rejuvenation retreat and i have special guests magenta pixie laura eisenhower and charlie freak who will be joining me and we will be going very very deep into or well, back to my spiritual roots of of working with mantra and prayer we'll be doing a lot of sacred music and we'll also be doing a lot of work with um uh, activating the age regeneration codons within our DNA. We have to do a bit of a clean up of our DNA because this age um, degeneration codon needs to be removed because that, that wasn't the original plan of the blueprint of, of our creation. We were created to coexist in these vessels for however long that we des we decide not, not be part of this um, false 80 to 100 year aging cycle pattern. So we're going to be completely and utterly freeing ourselves from that program. There's going to be loads of amazing things that I'm going to be sharing on the um, um, spiritual rejuvenation and solstice retreat. Beautiful. Jen, thank you so much. I appreciate you joining me. Thank oh, you. So wonderful to meet you, Joe. You're such a lovely man. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. God bless.